Good morning, friends. It's wonderful to have you joining me again for a short little morning devotional from the Psalms. I hope that you're all doing well. This is one of those things where we get to pray together, we get to reflect on God's Word together, but, you know, I'd love to hear how you're doing. If there's things in your life that you need prayer for, if there are, um, hey, that's particularly it. If there's things that I can be praying for for you, I would love to know about them so that I can keep you in prayer as uh, we journey on this in prayer together. I'm not saying pray publicly for you in this forum, but I just, I'd love to know how you're doing. I hear a lot of people saying they like getting together for this time together, um, and that's good, but it is, um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't replace our little Bible studies that we have. So I hope that you are well. This morning as we gather together, we're gathering to look at Psalm 17. And Psalm 17 is a cry for help. It's a cry from David to the Lord as David cries out to God and says, God, I'm feeling surrounded. I'm feeling overwhelmed. The wicked are there in my face right now. Where are you? Or what are you going to do, God? And I know we all have days where we feel that way. So I want you to be encouraged as you hear these words. I want you to reflect on your own life as well as you think about what, how do you address God? How do you come to God when you're feeling overwhelmed? And I want you to be encouraged to know that God receives your prayers just as he did David's here. In fact, those prayers that you're praying have the same guidance from the Holy Spirit that David had as he prayed this as well. God teaches us how to cry out to him when we are in need and when we're not in need. So turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 17 or just listen along as we read this together. Psalm 17, a prayer of David. Hear, O Lord, my righteous plea. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. May my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart and examine me at night, though you test me, you will find nothing. I have resolved my mouth will not sin. As for the deeds of men... By the word of your lips I have kept myself from the ways of the violent. My steps have held to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call on you, O God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me and hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand, those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who assail me, from my mortal enemies who surround me, they close up their callous hearts and their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down. They now surround me with eyes alert to throw me to the ground. They are like a lion hungry for prey, like a great lion crouching in cover. Rise up, O Lord. Confront them. Bring them down. Rescue me from the wicked by your sword. O Lord, by your hand, save me from such men, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. You still cherish, you still the hunger of those you cherish. Their sons have plenty, and they store up wealth for their children. And I, in righteousness, I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So David begins his prayer with a uh, uh, cry for vindication. He says, God, my heart is true before you. Now, can't understand this. He's not saying he's sinless. Uh, God didn't say that Job was sinless in saying that Job was a righteous man. But David's saying, before you, you know the state of my heart. You know that I have a pure heart to you. And in part of that, I think it is that David was a man who was quick to come to God and to confess. When he did something wrong, he didn't hide it away from God and pretend to be righteous. He ran to God and he repented. He said, Lord, forgive me. So we see this pattern here. He says, God, you know everything. You search my heart. Kind of almost a Wesleyan sense that he, every day, every night, he let his heart be examined by God to see what he had done right and what needed to be confessed to him. And then he goes back and he says, and I call on you because you answer me. It's this continuing sense that now David has an ongoing relationship with God. He knows that God is trustworthy. He knows that God is true. And he says, you will 
keep me. You will hide me, protect me from the mortal enemies who surround me, these wicked men. And he says lots of ways, has lots of different ways to describe them. But he says in verse 14, O Lord, by your hand, save me from such men, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. And that's a linchpin, isn't it, for a description between those who are uh, taking refuge in God and those who aren't. The idea is, where is your reward? Is your reward in this life or in the life to come? As Christians, we declare that the hope of the resurrection is that today we are pilgrims just passing through. We come only to proclaim the goodness of Christ and show the goodness of Christ in a broken world, knowing that the fullness of the reward that we will receive is in the life ahead of us. That's why when a righteous man or woman passes, we can say, uh, you know, they've gone to such, they've gone to their reward. And this is what David is referencing here. He's saying, save me from men who are living only for today in this dark way. We, I know that you are righteous, Lord. I know that you care for your children, that you, you love them. And in the end, in the last verse, verse 15, he banks on this. He says, and I know that no matter what happens, and he uses sleep here in an interesting wake here, in an interesting way, in righteousness I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. Now there, I don't know if he's talking about when he dies and then goes to see you, or if it's kind of a, I wake each new day and feel your presence with me sort of thing. But we know that it works both ways for us as well. Each day we wake in the presence of God. And we know that we have no fear of death because when we die, we will be in the presence of him who loves us with a never-ending, never-failing, everlasting, perfect love. Friends, as you go into this day, um, are you practicing that heart devotional that David did there? Are you daily asking God, how can I confess? Where do I need to, uh, to keep short accounts with you? And secondly, as you face challenges in this day, are you crying out to the Lord? And are you looking for your reward, not this life, but in the life to come? There's so much good stuff in this psalm. I hope it encourages you as you chew on it, meditate on it through the day, and uh, reflect on who Jesus is to you and for you today. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for this privilege of being able to gather together this morning to reflect on your word to feel the beauty of David's relationship with you and to see how that is our relationship with you as well. I pray, Father, that as we go from this place, whether we're just in our house or whether we're going to work or to, um, Lord, give us wisdom beyond ourselves. Give us a reliance on you that we may walk with you and talk with you and live for you and feel your presence with us. We pray for those that are going as doctors and nurses and those who are on the front line of caring for people in this crisis. We pray for your wisdom and your grace, your power and your protection for them. And we pray for loved ones who have lost people and friends who have friends in the hospital. We pray for your comfort and your shield, and we pray for Jesus' powerful hand to be at work in their lives and in our communities that many who have in the past lived for this life only would see and know the beauty of Christ and live to see his face instead. Thank you, Lord, for your promises and for your presence. We praise your name. Amen. Well, I hope that you have a beautiful day. God bless you and keep you.